So, in the last class, uh, I wanted to point out a couple of errors that I made. The hand window basically looks like this, it is a race cosine window. I had incorrectly written this down and nobody noticed this as uh, 1 plus cos 2 pi m by capital M. So, what is the, it must be 1 minus and it turns out that there is a normalizing factor of half so that the peak of the window is 1. Okay, it goes from 0 to 1. So, this is the hand window. So, if the input tone lies on a frequency bin, then when you window the sequence, the sample sequence and uh, compute the uh, coefficients of the discrete Fourier series, then what will happen? You will get leakage only at uh, adjacent bins. So, I did that. So, this is an example of a sine wave. Uh, this guy here is a sine wave at sine of 2 pi times 129 by 1024 times f s times t sampled at f s. Okay. So, this is the, the blue curve corresponds to a rectangular window. This is a rectangular window. And the magenta curve corresponds to a hand window. Right. Strictly speaking, there is no necessity for a window here other than a rectangular window simply because why? Because the input tone lies on a frequency bin. So, there will be no discontinuity at the edges. So, you will not see any, any Eiffel Tower at all. The purpose of the hand window is uh, here is just to illustrate what happens. So, you can clearly see that the main lobe is widened. It occupies three bins rather than one, which is what the rectangular window would do if the input was exactly on a frequency bin. And you can see that the, the side lobes are lower. I mean, ideally, you would expect to see no side lobes even for a rectangular window in this particular case, because the input frequency lies on a, is on a bin. But then why do you think uh, we see, we are seeing this stuff? Ideally, since the input tone is, uh, lies on a, on a bin, you would expect that there should be no leakage at all. And uh, whether you have a hand window or whether you have uh, a rectangular window, the side lobes must be infinitely small for a you uh, use either window. But then you, uh, you observe the following that the side lobes are definitely higher for the rectangular window than for the hand window. Uh, so, how do you explain this? First of all, why are we seeing all this? We are seeing these things which are about 300 dB below the uh, input tone. So that, that's simply machine precision. So that is some kind. You can think of it as some kind of noise that is added to the. It's round off noise added to the ideal sign. That noise is so small, but it, it is strictly not periodic. So you will see some leakage because of that noise not being a periodic sequence. And that, you know, as I uh, kept repeating uh, many times, is uh, very, very small and corresponds to the precision in your of uh, number representation on your computer. Nevertheless, we see that when you use a hand window, the side lobe performance of the hand window is is better than the rectangular window. So, while it is true that both these numbers are so small that they don't make a difference, one observation to make from these two is that. The side lobes you can see are definitely lower in the case of a hand wind. And the main lobe is wider. You see the fundamental tone when you multiply by the hand window will give you a component at the tone. I mean if I zoom in here what happens is it if I it will look like this. This corresponds to the input tone this corresponds to one bin to the left and this is one bin to the right. 
Can you comment on the value here versus the value here? These two will be equal, but and how will that compare to the stuff in the middle? 6 dB low. Often, so if you uh, put uh, an input tone on a bin and run a DIA FFT, you see some shape like this. So, um, but this is hardly what we are interested in, right? If the input tone lies on a bin, there is no need to go into all this window stuff. Okay, the real test is what happens when the tone doesn't lie on a bin. So, this is what happens. So, this is a rectangular window. And the input tone is 129.01 by 1024 times Fs. And this is the same tone with a hand window. I mean, I have only zoomed in around the bins that, that uh, matter. I mean, this is not the entire FFT. Uh, the, on the x axis is the bin number. And you can clearly see that the main lobe width is wider and the side lobes are smaller than the rectangular window. With the hand window, I mean, uh, this is what you get and you can see that uh, you are doing much better. How would you compute the energy of the sine wave? See, finally, when you want to compute, say, the signal to noise ratio or something, you want to compute the signal power. For a rectangular window without leakage, the signal power is simply the, the single bin which is the largest. For a hand window without leakage, the signal power is proportional to what now? The input sine wave is some A sine 2 pi times F in times T and F in happens to be 129 by 1024 Fs. The whole idea of computing the spectrum is to estimate powers of the fundamental and the harmonics. Thankfully, in this example, there are no harmonics, so we are only interested in computing what the power of the fundamental is. For a rectangular window, it is very straightforward. The single most coefficient, which is the only non-zero coefficient in principle, is directly proportional to the, okay, and thereby the power, alright. In a hand window, what do you do? You, you know a priori that when you multiply the, the uh, input by the hand window, the input tone leaks to one min on the left hand, one min on the right. So, the total power of the sine wave is not just that one bin, but you add the powers due to the bins on the left as well as the bin on the right. I mean, in a rectangular window, every the harmonic tones will also lie on a on a bin. Correct? So, if you take an M point FFT, there are M by 2 different unique bins because of symmetry. Okay, only one half of them are unique. Which means that in principle, if you remove the fundamental, you have room for M by 2 minus 1 harmonics. And if you choose the input frequency cleverly in the sense that if you make it a prime number and all this other stuff, then all the harmonics, I mean you can make sure that M by 2 minus 1 harmonics do not fight with each other, they do not overlap onto the same thing. The question he is now asking is what do you do in a hand case, when you hand window the input, each tone will basically map onto 3 bins. So, yes to that extent, the number of harmonics that you can represent without stuff overlapping is reduced, but that is not really a concern. Simply because any sample and hold which you should not be you know in a situation where you have to worry about the 365th harmonic of the sample and hold output being large. The, uh, the 365th harmonic of your sample and hold output sequence is large enough that you have to be worried about it that basically means that you have other problems to deal with. The FFT is the least of your worries. Typically well designed circuits you will find that the, uh, the harmonics very quickly you know fall down. So, you would not have to worry about any harmonic greater than the fifth harmonic. The rest of them, you know, it can be completely neglected and uh, or in other words, they will be so small compared to the fifth harmonic that uh, you do not have to worry about them, which means that if you take a reasonable number of points in the FFT, uh, like, you know, say 1024 or things like that, which are, you know, very, very reasonable things to do, then 
you don't have to worry about whether you use a hand window or some other window, it doesn't matter. Even though the main lobe is widened, you will find that you can still represent enough harmonics to be able to not worry about these things. These things have to do with uh, quantization noise. It is not, uh, the question is, how is it that uh, the magenta curve is below the blue curve here, but here it, uh, the two of them, you know, are comparable, okay. The answer to that has got to do with the way round of error is occurring. As I said, there are other windows uh, which are, you know, better side lobe performance than the hand window. And what can you expect? If the side lobe performance is better, the main lobe will become wider. And uh, a, a good example of uh, a good window which, anyway, these are all just names to remember, nothing, no major funda here. The, it's called the Blackman Harris window. The Blackman Harris window basically has got, has a better side lobe performance. when compared to the handing window. So, this is the hand, uh, the hand window and this is the Blackman window. And needless to say, all these are just named after the gentleman who came up with these numbers. The only uh, reason I am talking about uh, the hand and the Blackman Harris is the, are the following. See, in simulation, when you are running uh, sample and hold simulations, the easiest thing to do is what, what window do you think is the easiest thing to, to use? This is a computer, right? So, you can make Fn equal to whatever weird fraction of Fs you want. So, the rectangular window is the easiest thing to do. In a family of A to D converters called delta sigma or oversampling converters, it turns out that apart from the signal, there is also noise riding over the input. In which case, as I just pointed out here, you can see that when there is here also there is some some noise riding on top of the signal which is why the side lobes even though they are small occur and you can see that the hand window does much better with than the rectangular window when com when you compare this the side lobes. In simulation it is common to use either the rectangular window or in the case of oversampled day to day converters which we will cover in some detail later on in this course. You use the hand window. In practice, in measurement, when uh, the input of course is synchronous with, when you do coherent sampling, of course you can just simply use the rectangular window or the hand window. On the other hand, if the input and the source are not synchronous or not coherent due to, you know, limitations on the measurement equipment you have, then it makes sense to use window with much better side lobe separation. Okay, so in measurements it is common to use Blackman Harris if coherent sampling is not possible. Regardless of whether you are doing simulation or measurement, one thing is for sure is that if you increase the record length, if there is a discontinuity, if the input sequence is not strictly periodic, if you increase the record length, can you comment on, uh, on leakage? If you increase the length of the record, then any discontinuity, the energy of any discontinuity that occurs between the beginning of the record length and the end of the record length is spread out over a large number of bins. So, the energy of this leakage per bin will reduce. So, increasing the number of bins always helps. Uh, regardless of whether uh, you are doing simulation or experiment, if you increase the record length, if the source is not synchronous with the input, you will always do better for larger record lengths. Okay. By Parseval, the uh, mean square value of the uh, time domain sequence must be the sum of all the energies in all the in all the frequency bins. So, if you have a given discontinuity and if you have larger number of bins, then uh, the power in this discontinuity is, uh, is spread in many more bins when you have a larger record. Okay? So, increasing the record length always helps and in the limit you can uh, you will be able to appreciate this uh, uh, fairly easily because in the limit if 
n tends to infinity. The record length tends to infinity. Uh, you are computing the discrete Fourier transform of the of the sequence. Right? Or in other words, the resolution of the FFT becomes infinitely small. Okay? In simulation, however, there is a fundamental problem with uh, with increasing the bin lengths to uh, to very very large numbers. Can you guess why? The question is, we all agree that if you increase the record length, you are doing better with respect to leakage. Right? Whatever window you use. Okay? Window or no window. Longer the record length, you are doing better. Then the question is, why bother with all this? I will, in simulation itself, I will run, you know, huge record lengths and I should be all uh, happy with it. Right? I, I don't worry about leakage and all this other stuff. So, what uh, do you think uh, prevents me from taking such an approach? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, one is, I mean, of course, you cannot get another machine precision, but typical resolutions of uh, systems that we use, uh, we design and practice are not anywhere close to being ma machine precision. So, that we don't worry about. What else? What do you think is the practical difficulty? If you have to, if you have to grab uh, sample and roll outputs for very, very large record lengths, you have to simulate for a very, very long time. You understand? This is a nonlinear network. Numerical integration is going on inside to figure out what the output, uh, what the time is, uh, what the output voltages are uh, at every time step and so on. So, using very large record lengths, though uh, viable in theory, is not viable during simulation, simply because the simulation times will become very, very long. So, uh, during for simulation, you should always make sure that your record lengths are, are reasonable enough to be practical. On the other hand, during measurement, well, can you tell me what is practical? During simulation, it is not practical to have very large record lengths. Can you comment on uh, stuff at during measurement time? So, let's say you are sampling at uh, 100 megahertz, okay? So, collecting, you know, uh, 100 million samples, which is what 100 megahertz means, takes how much time? A sample and hold operating at 100 megahertz is pumping out? 100 million samples per second, right? So, it is entirely possible to collect vast data records by spending absolutely no amount of time at all. Okay, the only limitation is the amount of memory you have in, in whatever is capturing the, uh, the output. So, during measurement time, it is entirely practical to capture very, very long record lengths. Okay? So, uh, during measurement, it, uh, if you are, uh, especially if coherent sampling is not possible, the one good way of doing things is to capture raw, uh, long record lengths, which is entirely practical and use windows with very good side low performance. Uh, one example being the Blackman harassment. Memory, typically the memory is the limitation. In any case, we are not talking about, uh, you know, uh, I mean, when I say large record lengths, you know, maybe 32,000, 64,000, these are the kind of record lengths which will uh, give you, you know, fairly good results depending on uh, how coherent the input and the, the uh, sampling uh, signal are. And usually uh, this is not a, and all that I wanted to point out is that the concentrations you use during simulation can be different from the concentrations you use during measurement and uh, uh, you will be able to make only a clear judgment if you know the theory behind it. Fine. So, the last uh, question, one of these is a, a Hanning window, one of these uh, is the Blackman window, which is which? So, the, the verdict is blue is what? Blue is hand, why is it hand? If uh, pulse is wide in the, in the uh, time domain, it must be narrow in the frequency domain. Which of the windows is narrower in the frequency, has a smaller main lobe in the uh, frequency domain? Han or? Uh, Han has got? Smaller main lobe width, which means it must be narrower in the frequency domain. So, it must be wider in the time domain. So, this blue guy is the Han window and the red guy is the Blackman Harris. If the input lies exactly on a frequency bin, then the hand window will cause the input tone to spread to two neighboring bins. The question is, what happens in a 
Blackman window. It is wider and it turns out that, you know, four bins on each side is what is enough. Uh, if you put a tone exactly on a frequency bin, then a Blackman Harris window will basically uh, occupy four bins to the left, four bins to the right, and of course the input tone itself. This glitch is, I don't know what bin this is, man. I have no idea. Okay. The reason here is that uh, it's not exactly coherent. So, you know, you're not able to see that clearly. But uh, if on this diagram I had plotted a Blackman Harris window also, then you would see that this would, uh, the Blackman Harris window would be about 9 bins wide and the side low performance would be, uh, I would think, better than the hand. The reason why I have gone into excruciating detail uh, here at this stage itself is because you will repeatedly be using these tools. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention about is uh, clock generation. So far we have uh, merrily assumed that we have some phase phi 1, okay, some phase phi 2 which does not overlap with phi 1 and all this other stuff. I mean, you can't expect to get all these clocks from outside the chip. From outside a chip, you will only get one single clock. And from that clock, you have to generate all these myriad waveforms that you want. Phi 1, Phi 1A, Phi 2, Phi 2 bar, Phi 1 bar, all that have to be generated from some master clock. Uh, one problem that we have is the problem of generating non-overlapping clocks. Right, so once we generate phi 1 and phi 2, generating phi 1 a and phi 2 uh, bar and phi 1 bar and all that are quite straightforward. The a classic way of generating non-overlapping clocks is the following. So this is the master clock. So phi 1 and phi 2 will be non-overlapping. It's not immediately obvious how this, uh, uh, how somebody came up with the circuit in the first place, but somebody did, did and everybody has been using it ever since. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, you can trace through the circuit and make and and see for yourself that this is indeed non-overlapping. Okay, you can actually actually use even NOR gates instead of NAND gates. Uh, you, you can show that the non-overlap period <coughs> depends on the delays in in the two NAND gates. I mean, uh, I don't know how many of you are, uh, are aware of this notion that every gate has got finite delay. So, if you put one zero for a, into an AND gate, you get zero. And when the zero, the input zero changes to a one, the output would change to a one, but that will not happen. Instantaneously, there is some gate delay because, uh, you know, transistors have to charge and discharge nodes and so on and that takes time. Hmm? So, since there is, uh, so every gate has got a delay. So, you can actually trace through the uh, through the circuit diagram here and convince yourself that the delay between phi 1 and uh, phi 2 depends on the delays in these gates. If you want more delay or any suggestions, you can put uh, for example, if you wanted more delay, what you could do or and generate many other phases for example. So, if this is phi 1, this could be phi 1 bar. What could this be? This is phi 1. This occurs 2 inverted delays before phi 1. So, it is phi 1 advanced. And this is phi 2 and you know this is phi 2 bar and as you can see here, this is you know the delays of these inverters and all that due to, uh, is a bit ad hoc. It is not, I mean you figure out how much delay you need between uh, adjacent clocks and then you go and size these inverters properly. So, clock generation is you know is something that is done routinely by designers once you figure out exactly all the clocks that you want and 
the the uh, phase relationships between various clocks. So this is one. Uh, this clock generation is something that I forgot to mention uh, when I was discussing switches. So that is one thing. And the next thing is the following, right? So all that we have figured out is how to take an input voltage and sample it, uh, convert it into charge across a across a sampling capacitor. So now we have a charge on a capacitor, and we have to figure out how to take this charge in and quantize it. This capacitor here for example, the rest of the circuitry whatever is quantizing the voltage across the capacitor, one thing it, you must make sure is that this quantizer does not draw any charge from the capacitor. If it disturbs the charge that it is trying to draw, clearly I mean what it will quantize is not what you intended it to quantize. So there is clearly an error. So can uh, somebody tell me a simple way of the easiest way of uh, interfacing the capacitor, the sampling capacitor to a quantizer? You want to make sure that you draw no current from the capacitor. In principle what do you want to put between, uh, you want to sense something. You want to put a voltage controlled voltage source, so in principle you want to do this. The gain 1 is incidental, the gain could be larger, could be smaller, but the bottom line is that the input impedance of this uh, control source must be infinite and you know as a, a simple illustration, you know that you want to sample the, I mean the input for example, if I did not use bottom plate sampling, if I just used uh, regular top plate sampling, in any case the input will be, what kind of load does the input see? This is switching at a rate fs, okay. So during one half of the cycle, uh, the time during which fs is high, the input load looks capacitive, during the other half it looks like an open circuit. So, if you take any you know reasonably self respecting source, it will find that it gets very annoyed by when you have to drive switching loads. Because uh, you know it is ok to you know have a large load, but it is constant with time. But if things start to switch, alright, it turns out that this uh, you know a lot of uh, amplifiers driving such kinds of loads uh, would be put to a lot of difficulty. Simply one way, I mean one way of thinking about it is that the poles of whatever amplifier are driving the source, okay, these poles are within in quotes moving every time the switch is turned on. I mean while this is not a scientific explanation, you uh, can pretty well much see why this could be a problem. So uh, if you have to isolate the input from the switching uh, load. What, what do you think you will be able to do? You want to isolate this node from the input avoiding all these issues or to simply put a voltage control, voltage source thereby this uh, ensures this so VCVS here ensures that the input is not put to any difficulty. This VCVS here ensures that the voltage across the capacitor is not is not loaded by any circuit and that is why the voltage across the capacitor is held. In many cases you not only also, you not only want the voltage across the capacitor ok, so this is uh, some Vx which is held on the capacitor, you want to be able to amplify the voltage on the capacitor for further processing, right. You want to quantize the input, the input is sampled on this capacitor and that is Vx and uh, you want to work with not Vx but with 2Vx or 3Vx or 4Vx, okay. The advantage of working with large voltages is that the effect of errors in the circuits following can be you can make a larger mistake if the range is increased. Does that make sense? 
So, the next thing is, how do I take this voltage which is stored on a capacitor Vx and make it a large voltage. Does that make sense? So, any suggestions? One uh, way is to say, okay, you know, I know how to make an op amp, okay, I will put a voltage, I mean, I know this 1 plus R2 by R1 formula, so I will build an ideal op amp or rather an op amp which is as ideal as possible and put in feedback across it, uh, you know, two resistors, the values of the resistors being what I want uh, to get again that I desire. For example, if I wanted a gain of 2, I will put two equal resistors in feedback. For example, I will take this voltage and then take an op amp. So, this will give me a voltage at the output which is Vx times 1 plus R2 by R. This is simple straightforward way of doing it. Another way of doing it doing accomplishing the same thing is to make the following observation. See, a capacitor is nothing but a bucket which holds charge. The height of water in the bucket is indicative of of the voltage across the capacitor and the volume of water in the bucket is equivalent to charge. So, this is charge, the height is the voltage and if you have a linear capacitor, Q is C times V. So, the capacity of the bucket is nothing but, I mean uh, in the fluid analogy, uh, I mean the cap capacitance is analogous to It is the cross section area of the bucket, right. So, if you assume that the, bu the bucket has got a uniform cross section, then the charge, the volume of water in the bucket is nothing but the area times the height and the larger the area of the cr of cross section, the larger the amount of charge you can hold for a given potential, right, straightforward enough. Now, based on this analogy, can you think of what I can do to make the height of the uh, water in the, so I have Vx stored in the, on the capacitor, I mean the voltage across the capacitor because some charge is sitting on the capacitor. I want to generate two Vx, okay, so if you have a bucket with uh, water uh, with a height of some 10 centimeters, you want higher voltage means you want the higher level of, uh, clearly if I take a bucket and try to cut it in half, I mean I have a, I have a, a not working bucket. So, clearly, uh, I mean I cannot simply chop the area of the bucket in half. What I should do is find a bucket with whose area is half this bucket and and pour this water into, into the other bucket. So, if I took all this water and had a bucket whose area of cross section was uh, one half of the original bucket, then So, I have the same charge in, I take the original bucket, find a bucket with one half the area and pour the water that I have properly without spilling into the, into the second bucket and lo and behold the, uh, this simply becomes 2 Vx. So, what you can do with buckets, you can as well do with capacitors. So, the basic idea is to take a capacitor with some charge on it and somehow transfer all this charge onto into a capa into a within quotes a charge bucket which is half as big uh, half as wide so which is equivalent to saying that try and transfer all this charge onto 
a capacitor which is one half the size. If you want to transfer charge from one capacitor to another capacitor, what do we do? You connect the two together, isn't it? So, let us say this was C1, this was charged to V1, this was C2 and it was not charged to anything and I will connect the two together. What is the final charge on Q2? So, initial charge on Q uh, uh, on uh, C1 is C1 V1. 